The, the intention is harm less animals, do more good in the world. That's great. I want to do the same thing. They're going about it all the wrong way. Am I making this decision to eliminate meat from my diet based on the proper information? Or did I watch a vegan documentary on Netflix, which may or may not be the full story? There's a lot of evidence that meat and organs especially, which we can talk about, things that have really been left out of human diet are so beneficial for humans. We're just going to hop right into it. Um, I ate a lot of meat, a lot of bone broth, but so much ancestral blend, <laughs> a lot of organs. And I feel like, I mean, I had such great pregnancies. I think that was a big part of it. I don't doubt it. I mean, this is so evolutionarily consistent. One of the things that I was never taught in medical school was anthropology. But if you go to cultures around the world, this is what they do. You know, I went to Tanzania. I spent time with the Hadza, some of the last hunter gatherers left on the planet. When a woman's pregnant or wants to get pregnant, they feed them organs and meat. This is like, this is, we, we've known this. This is human wisdom that's been forgotten. And it's especially, like you said, especially for women, it's been kind of programmed out of us and women, especially. Totally. I, th I think where I know what you're talking about, there's an intuition. Like I, I was at, I don't know if you ever went in LA, there was this place called Bel Campo. It's not open. I know it. Amazing meat. And there was a piece of liver on the table and I'd never had liver before in my life, but something intuitively told me to eat the liver. So I ate it and I had, it was bouncing off the walls like crack cocaine. And I was like, wow, my body was telling me I wanted it. I ate it. And it just gave me all this energy. I want to talk to you. And I really wanted to have you on because like you just said, there has been a big push on social media with veganism, um, especially with women. How do you start that conversation in a way that's one respectful towards vegans, but also informative? So vegans, they're they're so right about their intention. They want to do well, right? The, the intention is harm less animals, do more good in the world. That's great. I want to do the same thing. And I think that they're going about it all the wrong way, right? Because if you break it down at every level, I think that it doesn't really hold up to intellectual scrutiny. So if you start with the health level, because we're talking about the health of humans, the health of women and men, fertility, whatever we were trying to manifest in our lives, whether it's clear skin, weight loss, energy, libido, fertility, all these things, you can see that there are unique nutrients in meat that you just cannot get from plants. You just can't get them from plants. And so where does a vegan get creatine, for instance, this this nutrient that many men know about, but women don't necessarily know about. But creatine is essential for muscle recovery. I mean, if a woman is doing Pilates or yoga or a man is lifting weights, they know about creatine. But again, like you get it from meat and animal products. It doesn't exist in the plant kingdom. It doesn't exist. And it's been associated with improvements in intelligence. So you can take vegans or vegetarians who don't have much creatine in their diet and you give them five grams of creatine per day. And then you retest them in terms of card sorting tasks and memory tasks, and they get smarter. So creatine is this central nutrient for humans. It's probably the single most studied nutrient in terms of ergogenic supplements, which is what a fancy word we use for like muscle building and recovery and even for brain health. And again, it's not present in plants. And that's just the first one. We've got carnosine, carnitine, anserine, taurine, vitamin K2, B12. The list is so long. And then you look at the bioavailability of minerals, for instance, magnesium or zinc or iron. So many women are anemic or they're subclinically anemic. They don't have enough iron because the iron in plant foods is not an organic form of iron. It's not heme iron, which is an iron in sort of this porphyrin ring, which is a fancy word for the, the basically the middle of your hemoglobin molecule. The hemoglobin uh, is, is this porphyrin ring, which holds an iron. And the human body is sort of built to absorb iron in that fashion. So there's all of this sort of story and like history written into us as humans that we've been prioritizing meat for our whole evolution. And you're right. It's been sort of, it's been programmed out of us through vegan documentaries and people believing or hearing a story, which I think is false, that meat is not good for you or not good for the planet. But when you really look at it, it's so nutritive for us and it has so many essential nutrients that allow us to thrive. I mean, that's what you were saying, that you felt better with it. 
I want to go back with you just real quick. I mean, and I feel like now, especially over the last two or three years, I see your stuff everywhere. You've done an incredible job getting yourself out there and like really kind of like educating people online. And I, I don't, and I'm sure you've been doing it for much longer. And it's funny. People talk to us and think, Oh, I just started seeing your stuff. I'm like, yeah, we've been doing it for like 13 years, but, but, um, I started seeing your stuff start popping off maybe like two or three years ago. And now I see you everywhere probably because I'm looking at this kind of content. But for those that are unfamiliar with you and your platform, maybe a brief background in your credentials and how you kind of got into this space. Yeah. So I'm a traditionally trained physician. I went to PA school first. So PA is physician assistant. And I worked in cardiology for four years. Then I went back to medical school. So I went to medical school like one and a half times because as a PA, I saw that the medical system wasn't really working to address the root cause of illness. And I wanted to be able to do that. And PAs, physician assistants, nurse practitioners do great work, but oftentimes they're sort of beholden to the intentions of the physician that they're working with. So I went back to medical school at the University of Arizona, got my MD. Oh, and I did wildcat, huh? Yeah. Same with me, Harvard of the desert, but I didn't go to medical school though. I was, I was studying something else. <laughs> Tucson though. Yeah, Tucson. But then yeah. I did residency at the University of Washington in Seattle. And the whole time I was in medical school and residency, I sort of knew that I wanted to do something aimed at root cause medicine. I was just, I don't know. I think that I'm more of an engineer in my mind than, than, than the doctor. And I just, I, I'm fascinated by the way things work. And it's not interesting to me when you can give someone a pill and it, and it affects a symptom, right? So you have a headache, you take Tylenol. That's not interesting to me. What I want to know is why did you get the headache in the first place? Were you dehydrated? Is it a food allergy? Did you not sleep well? Did you mess up your circadian rhythm? I want to know the root cause. And the same thing for me. So I had eczema growing up all in my fingers, my elbows, and I had asthma. These two conditions associate together. They're called atopic conditions. Atopic dermatitis is eczema and asthma. And my dad was a doctor. My mom was a nurse practitioner, but they didn't really have the training in their history to ask, why is our son having eczema and asthma? The subtle, not so subtle propaganda given to doctors and physicians and nurses is this is just bad genetics, which is, in my opinion, completely wrong. This is where medicine is doing people such a disservice. So it's not that the, your child has eczema or you have eczema or psoriasis or any medical condition because you have bad genetics. I believe 99% of the time it's because there's a discordance between how you're living your life and what your body's expecting. And I focus mostly on food, but environment makes a big difference too. So I went back to medical school to really have the credentials and the ability to do that on my own. And then a, 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 along the journey, I sort of took this left turn because in my residency, I had a horrible flare of eczema, like really bad, my whole body on my elbows. I remember I was on a date with a woman in Seattle and she said, what happened to your arms? And I was too embarrassed to tell her it was eczema. And I told her I'd fallen in a patch of poison oak. That was what it looked like. And so at that point, I got really fed up with what was going on in my life. And I was eating a healthy diet at the time, but that was more paleo. I was eating salads and nuts and seeds and fruit and meat and eggs. And I think I was taking some kind of mushroom extracts. And I said, you know what? I've heard about this thing called the carnivore diet. I'm just going to do that, get rid of everything except meat and see if it helps my autoimmune is issues, which were eczema at the time. And lo and behold, it did. But there's been a whole journey, and we'll talk about that, because I ended up reincorporating some plant foods later. But that was the first sort of light bulb for me. Wow, el elimination diets, being intentional with your food is hard, but it can be very powerful for people who are not finding improvements, especially in their autoimmune diseases. So since then, um, after residency, I got board certified in nutrition as a physician, and then kind of, I got really interested in this, this path and started doing mostly education. And so now that's what I do. I do social media, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, podcasting, and it's been a fun journey, but I never expected to be this kind of doctor, quote unquote. Oh, have you healed your eczema completely? I don't see any. Oh, on yeah. you. It's and gone. what about asthma? Oh, it's gone. What's the root cause of asthma? Did you find that out? I think it's the same. So my high level idea is that these autoimmune diseases are primarily triggered by our food. And that we, we, there's so much mechanistic evidence for this, and it starts in the gut. So what happens is if you look at someone with multiple sclerosis, for instance, which is a demyelinating process in the brain, so your neurons in your brain are wrapped in this glia and this, this myelin sheath. Um, the glia make this myelin sheath on the neurons. And so if you look in the brain of someone with multiple sclerosis, you find immune cells that are having an, a reaction against that myelin and demyelinating but you can actually tag those cells and look at where they've come from and they've come from the gut. And so when you look at someone with type one diabetes, which is where the immune system attacks the pancreas, you find immune cells and where are they from? They're from the gut. So there's so much interesting evidence in medicine that these autoimmune diseases begin here. They begin in our gut. And so it's this, I think that there are these foods which are so interesting to look at because some of them are considered healthy. Many of them are 
processed, ultra processed foods, but some of them might even be considered healthy that can trigger the immune system, the majority of which resides around our gut, around our intestines. Think we never think about all the magic that happens between your, your mouth and your butt, you know, when you poop or whatever. And that I think is where most of this autoimmune illness begins. And so it's about calming that immune system and figuring out how to interact with your immune system that's in your gut. What is this perfect poo? Tell us what the perfect <laughs> poo is. Have you, heard, have you heard of ghost poo? A ghost poo. No, tell us about a ghost. <laughs> tell us about all the different kinds of poo. We tell were me. working out today and I was saying that the way I think about it is like, you know, if you, your dog goes and he's not sick, goes to the bathroom, he doesn't need to like go and clean himself. You don't up. have he's to just, wipe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So explain that to the audience. Well, I mean, that's just kind of this funny term for every once in a while. I mean, as a, as a guy, I, I, you know, you go poop and you just don't even have to wipe or you wipe and there's nothing on the toilet paper. But why? I think it's, it doesn't always have to be a full ghost poop, but if you're pooping and there's a lot of stuff on the toilet paper, or you really have to clean your butt or you have to like get in the shower or use a bidet to like clean your butt. <laughs> I love that we're talking about this on your podcast, by the way, that's like indicative, indicative of something going on. And I think most of us know this. We don't talk a lot about poop. Maybe you guys talk about poop more than I think. We talk about poop. Oh, amazing. I try not to, but <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not like pooping in front of my husband. Trust me. I keep things sexy. I like that. But I, I do like, I talk about it in general. But your point is, is like, if you're, if you're having those kind of, if you're having to clean up incessantly, there's probably maybe an there's issue. There's something going because, on. And, and, and that was, we were literally talking about it at the gym. I was like, hey, you never see an animal have to like clean themselves up. It doesn't. They're it, not like, where's the Kleenex to wipe my ass? When, 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 when you eat a lot of protein, it's, it is a ghost poop is what you're saying typically. Well, I think when you eat foods, it doesn't have to be protein. You can also eat, in my view, fruit. And if you do things that aren't irritating your gut, and it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean it's just meat. I eat a lot of fruit, honey, things like that. We can talk about it. Dairy, uh, raw dairy, which is a whole interesting conversation. Then when the gut is not inflamed, the quality of the poop is different. So that's, that's the centerpiece of this conversation. And when the gut is inflamed, everybody knows their poop is different. How is your poop when you eat a really, really hot, spicy meal? You feel it. Like your poop is kind of inflamed. You can feel it in your butt. It like hurts the poop. Well, that's because that spicy food is irritating your gut. We know this. I mean, spicy food, people love it and they get really triggered when I talk about spicy food. I'm triggered right now. I love spicy I know. food. I didn't know that it's bad for you. It, it, it's been shown in cell culture to really cause leaky gut. Fuck. I, I literally can take a habanero pepper and eat like ghost pepper. I can eat it with my bare hands. Well, good. Maybe don't go to the bathroom in front of me. You know what? <laughs> I think we should title this episode How to Get a Ghost Poop with Paul. Well, I have like, we, you know, <laughs> Typically, we run these things like right off the cuff. We do a little prep. We have a lot for you. And I think there's there's so much ground we can cover. And I'm trying to think about the best way to format this because this is a fascinating topic to, to many. But staying on the topic of, you know, meat versus no meat diet. Why? I mean, and at one point, I know you've re recently rebanded and you at one point were Carnivore MD, but now just Paul Saladino. Yeah, yeah. Which I want to talk about. But why do you... So the pushback that you you might have against people that have eliminated meat from their diet completely why would you maybe tell them to think about reincorporating? So like we said earlier, I think the beginning of the conversation is empathy. And I think that a lot of people have eliminated their meat from their diet for the right reasons. They were being intentional. I love it when people make intentional food choices because I think the hardest thing, we were at HEB last night filming content. And I think the hardest thing for me is when I see people who are not intentional with their diet at all. They're just sort of going about it as a zombie. They're just grabbing chips off the, off the aisle and not even thinking about it at all. So I, I love it when people are vegetarian or vegan because it means they've made an intentional choice. They've said, I'm not going to eat this food. Great. That's step one. Step two is making sure that you are making that decision based on the proper information. And that's where I want to add to the conversation and hopefully help make people curious and, and allow them to think, am I, making this con am I making this decision to eliminate meat from my diet based on the proper information? Or did I watch a vegan documentary on Netflix, which may or may not be the full story? So that's what I hope to bring to the equation is there's a lot of evidence that meat and organs, especially, which we can talk about things that have really been left out of the human diet are so beneficial for humans. Yeah. I went to dinner. Um, I was just in New York city yesterday and I was at dinner the night before and I was sitting with someone, I won't say who, and they were telling me that they eliminated meat from their diet within the last two years. And I was like, I just asked him curious. I don't, I don't care, but I was, you know, and I still ordered a steak. I said, why, um, why? And they said, well, the daughter showed me this documentary on Netflix and was really passionate about it. And I, <laughs> Everyone like, well, says that. I said, well, do you feel, do you feel better? Do you feel different? Were you working on a health condition? And it was really like, no, but after seeing that and being told, and we're talking about somebody that's almost like 55 years old and has been a mediator throughout his life. Um, 
And that was kind of the explanation. And to me, it just sounded strange because I was like, well, you've got that one piece of information and have kind of disregarded all the rest. And, you know, if it's a moral issue, I don't care if it's a conscious, but it was just literally because of that thing. And I just thought it was kind of strange. It's difficult because not everyone is a doctor and can go to PubMed, right? Sure. Not everyone can go to the internet. I mean, not even, I mean, you can go to Google Scholar, but the internet is a strange place now, right? I mean, social media companies definitely lean left. So your media is going to lean left. You're not going to see a study on CNN or even probably on Fox News talking about the benefits of red meat. I mean, the FAO just came out with something that said that, that, that meat is essential for optimal human health and provides unique nutrients. Someone You're just not going to see even a, a study on any of those shows saying that exercise could be beneficial. Right. right? So like, if they're not telling you that, then you're, you're definitely not telling you about the diet. Yeah. Or vitamin D or any of these things. Yeah. And so there's just there's no lifestyle stuff on there unless it aligns with their, their overall narrative, which is that meat is bad for the environment. Therefore, you should not be eating it. I mean, my, you know, one of my people on my team was just showing me something. Uh, Eric Adams, the mayor of New York, was bloviating about, we know that that meat is not good for humans. And we know that plant-based diets are better for health and the environment. And I just thought, we know? Like that is far from settled. That is a very interesting conversation. And it, here's this guy sort of crusading. Isn't said, it true though, and you are the perfect person to ask this, is that it's, someone told me this, so this could be wrong, that veganism and plants is actually hurting animals more. Isn't there yes. something, can you explain that? Yeah, yeah. So there's a, so we talked about this a little bit earlier. So when someone makes this intentional choice to be vegan and vegetarian, great. Great first step. We can go back to the health issue, but let's just put the health issue aside. Let's talk about environmental issues or ethical issues. Uh, I think a really laudable thing that vegans and vegetarians may believe is that they don't want to cause excess suffering in the world. Great. What we understand as humans, and this is a very interesting thing for most of us that didn't grow up in the woods, is that in order for something to live, something else must die. This is just the way life works. And it's kind of a hard thing that we wrestle with as kids. Like, I don't want to hurt anything, but but this is the way of life, right? There's, a, there's an interesting woman named Lear Keith who was a previous vegan. She became a meat eater. And she tells this story of having a garden. And she wanted to be a vegan and she had this garden, but she realized that to have a garden, she had to kill the slugs because the slugs were eating her lettuce. And she had to put in manure or animal products to get the, the, um, you know, the, the plants to grow well. And so she realized, look, manure came from an animal that didn't have to be killed, but the bones and the calcium, that had to come from an animal. And so there's, this, there's a cycle of life and death and you're going to kill slugs to even create the plants. But let's just think more broadly about plant agriculture. How do you make, how do you grow plants? How is kale grown or spinach grown? It's grown in a field, probably in the Central Valley of California or somewhere that was at one time trees. And at one time there were voles and, you know, mice or, you know, rabbits living there with snakes and beetles and bugs and birds in those trees. And so in order to get to that land to be able to grow plants, you have to cut all that stuff down. Then you have to till the soil. And when you till the soil, you destroy the topsoil. So this is kind of boring soil, you know, science, but the soil is a really interesting ecosystem, like our life science in the eighth grade. There's all sorts of things in the soil. There's all sorts of bacteria and fungi that are working together. There's earthworms. And when you till the soil, you release all the carbon dioxide in the, in the, in the soil. It just goes up into the atmosphere. So you're emptying the soil or the topsoil of the carbon dioxide. You're sort of destroying the soil. One way to kill ground and make it very bad for planting in your garden at your house or to grow plants is to till the soil. So at this point, you've leveled the trees. So you've killed trees, you've displaced birds, potentially killed rabbits and voles and anything else living in the soil. When you're tilling, you're killing the things in the soil. Not to mention then harming the things that eat those things. Exactly. So think about the thousands, the tens of thousands of lives that are lost in the creation of a field to grow plants. And then you're growing the plants. Hopefully you're not putting uh, pesticides on those plants, right? And if you are putting pesticides, is it glyphosate or some other pesticide, which is water soluble and leading into the water table and is ending up in our water table. So now you're harming everything downstream of that, whether it's animals, um, anything else in the life cycle that is eating those animals is going to bioaccumulate the glyphosate. It's going to end up in our water supply. So unless you're purifying your water, it has pesticides and glyphosate in it. And then you might have to put nitrogen fertilizer back in the soil because without animal input into soil, you will click quickly deplete the nutrients required to grow those plants. So this has been happening for generations. And if you talk to any farmer, um, I'm good friends with Will Harris, who runs White Oak Pastures in Georgia. And I've been to that farm. It's so fascinating. I mean, in the 1930s and 1940s, these, these sort of fertilizer salesmen made a killing because they came with this nitrogen fertilizer that was discovered sort of in the World War II effort, I believe. And it just it allowed plants to grow, but it's a fake solution. It's not actually the nutrients that animals put back in. But what they do at White Oak is they have cows on the land, right? So when, what people don't realize is that 
when you have animals living on the land, you create a fertile soil and plants that grow just mightily. They grow so well. That's how the grasslands in the United States were grown. Millions of bison pooping and peeing and walking and pressing their poop and pee into the ground, which moves all the nutrients back into the soil. It's a cycle. The ruminant animal, which is an animal with cloven hooves, like a goat or a cow or a bison or something, eats the grass, which humans can't eat because of the silica. Grass is not a food for humans. And then they cycle it back into the ground. So none of those nutrients are lost. They're putting it back into the ground and they actually increase the carbon in the soil. So they're sequestering carbon into the soil, which is kind of where it belongs. So there's a real difference between plant agriculture and animal agriculture. And what people also fail to appreciate is that the way to have healthy plants is to put animals on the land because the poop and the pee from animals is what makes the soil healthy. And then you get amazing plants. The grass at White Oak Pastures is nuclear green and it's neon green. It's this, it's the brightest green I've seen. And there's bugs and birds. And when they move the cattle, I got to see them move a thousand head of cattle from one field to another. These cows are so excited. They just run into this field and it's just all grass that's regrown over the last few weeks. It's just like a, a buffet for them of the best, most evolutionarily appropriate healthy food for cows. And they just run in and they all spread out and they start eating this grass. And then there's birds and bugs. It's just like a it's just the way life is supposed to be, right? It's mirroring the way that these ruminants have moved on the land. So there's a real stark juxtaposition between what happens when you grow plants and when you can grow animals if you do it correctly. Does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense. I've never heard it explained like that's very interesting. Yeah, so from a moral standpoint, like even if you are growing plants the way that we do now, like there's something is dying. And exactly. I, I think- So like the underlying vibe of the self-righteousness, <laughs> because there is a little bit of self-righteousness yeah. Yeah is can sort of be eliminated now after learning that. Yeah. And look, you're going to have to kill one of those cows to feed a person. But you think about how much nutrition comes from one single life of a cow who has the end of its life. I mean, every animal on that field is going to die at one point, either by old age or if they're in the wild and it's the bison cousin of a cow, it's going to get taken down. by. I think a, people a also wolf. forget when when things get killed in the wild, it's not like people talk about hu being humane. Right. Have you ever I mean, if you've ever seen predators kill right. prey. It is, I mean, I had a dog, unfortunately, passed away and, and it was, we, we, a long time when I was a kid, but a bunch of coyotes got into our yard. Um, and they, it wasn't like a humane kill. Like they ate this thing from the ass up while it was still alive. And like, that's how they kill in the wild. It's not a nice way to go. I, I would argue that it's more humane sometimes if a hunter takes out an animal that's getting older and maybe going, because what happens is these animals age and they get old and they get slow and the pack kind of leaves them and then predators come in and they eat them and they do it in a very violent, vicious way where they suffer. Yeah. And the way that, so there's a couple of ways that, that cows can be raised if we talk about cows. And the, the best way is, is the blueprint of white oak pastures and other farms that are regenerative doing it that way. And they're raising the cows on the land. They're rotating fields. They're only eating grass from the day they're born. I mean, I guess they're eating milk from their mothers, but grass and milk, what they're supposed to eat. And then they, when they're, when they're harvested, when they're killed, they're done in a very humane fashion. There are ways that cattle ranchers do this that are kinder, quote unquote, to the cattle. And that may sound crazy, but what happens is you lead the cattle into this area where they're kind of, they're, they're sheltered. It's kind of like a security blanket and they, they don't freak out. They're just, they're in a, um, a paddock where there's supports on both sides. And then they use a bolt gun and they're, their, their life is over in an instant. It's essentially like a hunter killing an animal with one shot with a rifle. And look, it sounds crazy and we don't want to believe it, but we have to go back to what you said. There's always death to support life. And so I think that just gives us an imperative as humans. If I'm eating any food on the planet, whether it's a piece of kale or spinach or a cow, I should understand and appreciate that and kind of do the best I can in my life to, to honor that cycle because I will be a part of that cycle at some point in my life. I am in France. And one thing that I packed, you know what it is, is my beauty water drops by Saqqara. I use these drops every single morning to spice up my water. They're absolutely amazing. They don't really taste too crazy. And when I travel, I put them in like ice water. I even add them to my tea. I also use them at home. But I noticed when I was packing, like it was a non-negotiable. If you have not tried their beauty drops and their detox drops, you are missing out. If you're unfamiliar with Saqqara, they are amazing. Basically, they bring expertly designed organic nutrition programs and wellness essentials like my drops right to your door. They have science-backed, ready-to-eat meals that deliver results that you can see and feel. So they really focus on like weight management and easing bloat and boosting energy and clearer skin. So sort of like healing from the inside out, which I'm all about. You've probably seen their ready-to-eat delivered meals on Instagram. They're so beautiful. 
everything is picked in such a strategic way so you just feel great when you eat them. So if you're looking for a meal delivery service, you have to check out their plant-rich organic meals. And also, I'm telling you, get those drops for your morning routine. Right now, Sakara is offering our listeners 20% off with their first order when they go to sakara.com slash skinny. Or you can enter skinny at checkout. That's sakara, S-A-K-A-R-A dot com slash skinny. You get 20% off your first order. Sakara.com slash skinny. What are you waiting for? Every single morning, we go downstairs, I prepare breakfast, and my daughter asks for a vitamin. She asks me, she reminds me, which is so incredible. And I let her pick the colors. There's pink, there's yellow, there's green. She usually goes for pink. And the vitamin brand that she uses is Haya Health. This is pediatrician approved chewable vitamins. I found after lots of research that most kids' vitamins are filled with like five grams of sugar. And they're basically like candy in disguise. So Haya has zero sugar and zero gummy junk. And it really zones in on what your child needs. So like vitamin D, B12, C, zinc, folate. But it tastes so good. And I know this because I tried them. They also have little stickers that they can like decorate with. So cute. It comes with the first order. So Haya is also non-GMO, vegan, allergy-free, gelatin-free, nut-free, and everything else you can imagine. I just feel like this is a great vitamin choice if you have kids. And of course, we have a special deal with Haya. It is for their best-selling children's vitamin, the one Zaza takes, and you receive 50% off your first order. To claim this deal, you must go to HayaHealth.com slash skinny. This deal is not available on their regular website. So you're going to go to H-I-Y-A-H-E-L-T-H.com slash skinny and get your kids the full body nourishment they need to grow into healthy adults. Go to H-I-Y-A-H-E-A-L-T-H.com slash skinny and get your kids the full body nourishment they need to grow into healthy adults. Quick break to talk about our sponsor, Squarespace. One of our favorite platforms is a one-stop shop for everything you need to build online, and it's called Squarespace. Squarespace is the key you have been looking for to develop your online presence, your website, your e-com site, and so much more. Long gone are the days of working with five different companies to build a beautiful, functional website. You can now do it all in one place, cost effectively and efficiently, all at Squarespace. So What exactly is Squarespace? Squarespace is an online platform that lets you build incredible websites, e-commerce sites, and more all on one platform where you own all of the content. This is a key in 2023, not putting yourself at the mercy of third-party platforms and actually owning all of your content. You can also centralize all of your data in one place and connect all of your social media accounts. If you are living in 2023 and don't have your own online presence, I think you're making a huge mistake. Some other functions of Squarespace include email campaigns, the ability to collect donations, exclusive membership platforms, SEO tools, and completely mobile optimized websites. And again, you can build all of this in one place cost effectively. Literally anyone can build and control their own websites on anything you care about now at Squarespace. Trust me, it's a game changer. So head over to squarespace.com skinny for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, Use offer code SKINNY to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Again, that's squarespace.com slash SKINNY. And use offer code SKINNY to save 10%. That's squarespace.com slash SKINNY. Check it out. I think people envision the the way like some humans die of old age where you go peacefully in your sleep. It's like, that's not how it happens in the wild. <laughs> they go and a, they, a pack of wild animals literally tears them apart limb from limb while they're still breathing and living. Like that's just how it goes. Yeah. Like, that's, that's the cycle of life out there in the wild. Exactly. If someone's listening and they're vegetarian or they're vegan and they want to dip their toe into eating more meat, is there a way to do that? Or can they just rip the Band-Aid off and start eating meat and they'll be fine? I think that this is a really good question. One of the things that's interesting about the human body is that when you stop eating meat, some of the digestive enzyme in, in your stomach may change and the acidity may change a little bit. I think people run into this little bit of a, a vicious cycle because Zinc is one of the minerals we mentioned earlier that's much more bioavailable in meat than it is in plants. And so if people are just eating plant foods, they may get a zinc deficiency because there's not really much bioavailable zinc in any plant food. I was a raw vegan for seven months, 15 years ago. So I remember being in this world. When I was a raw vegan, people said, oh, you have to eat pumpkin seeds. Okay, pumpkin seeds are probably the only source of zinc in the plant kingdom. But the problem with pumpkin seeds is all that zinc is bound up in things like phytic acid and oxalates. These are big molecules that chelate the zinc, they bite the zinc, and they make it very poorly bioavailable. This is a whole separate conversation about the lack of bioavailability of minerals in plant foods. The reason this makes no sense to me, so and I just think about like what we had access to as we were evolving. 
if you're telling me that I could develop a zinc deficiency in a, 200 years ago, and the only way that I could fix that is if I, and I wasn't eating meat, is I could go and, and scrounge around and find pumpkin seeds to fix it. Like that just doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me from an evolutionary standpoint, because what if I didn't have access to the pumpkin seeds? I just develop a zinc deficiency. And you and really gets, wouldn't even fix it because there's not even that much bioavailable yeah, zinc. So, you, so your, your immune system gets worse, your yeah, gut gets and, worse. And you need zinc to make stomach acid, to your point. So the problem is that people who are vegan, when they try to transition to meat, they have to do it slowly. So you eat a little bit of meat and you get some zinc and then a little more meat, you get some zinc because you're going to, you could be zinc deficient and that could lead to a condition called hypochlorhydria, which is low stomach acid. So all sorts of things get better for people when they start eating meat. But I think to your point, do it gradually and see how you feel. And even maybe start with something like organs or the desiccated organs that I brought. These are capsules that are organs in a capsule that could be nutrients, but they're small doses. Let's stay on this for a second. In your opinion, if you had eliminated meat from your diet outside of a potential zinc deficiency, if you couldn't supplement with pumpkin seeds, what other things could you potentially become deficient in? And what what is the manifestation of becoming deficient in things like a zinc or a whatever else you're going to name right now? Right. So you hit on zinc. So you could get stomach acid problems. You could get immune issues because your immune system, when you're zinc deficient, wounds don't heal. For those who are watching, I should probably explain that I have this wound on my head from a surfboard fin that hit me in the head. <laughs> healing fast. It's healing well. Um, you get iron deficient, which is going to cause anemia and that's going to cause energy problems. So many women, especially because they're menstruating and they're always losing a little bit of iron when they have their periods, feel so much better when they incorporate red meat, probably because of the iron and the ability to make red blood cells. So anemia is not having enough red blood cells. You could get deficient in things like B12. Most vegans know this and will supplement with B12, but again, B12 not found in the plant kingdom. B12 is essential for DNA creation, repair, and for the formation of cells in our body, including the red blood cells. You could get deficient in things like vitamin K2, which is a form of vitamin K. K1 is involved in clotting, but K2 appears to be essential for calcium partitioning in the human body. And there's interesting studies like the Rotterdam study, which suggests that people who get more vitamin K2, which is found essentially only in animal foods, there's one exception, which is natto, which is fermented soybeans, but it's from the bacteria in the natto, not the soybeans. But more K2 is associated with significantly less coronary artery disease and less calcification of the aortic valve. So K2 you could get deficient in, creatine we talked about, minerals beyond those, manganese, so many things, selenium, and the list is so long. It's crazy. It, you're explaining to a kindergartner right. what to look for in a meat. Like if someone's going to the store, what are some things that you are not compromised? Like what are things that you're looking for when you look? Because because there's different kinds of meat, right? Right. So what are those pillars that we need to be looking for? So I think that I never want finances to be a barrier to someone actually getting meat. If you can only afford to eat like the big meat rockets, I call them at like Walmart or something, then that's better than nothing, right? What about the leg at Disneyland? <laughs> if someone's chewing on one of those turkey legs, is that okay? Well, it depends what it's cooked in, right? Because then you have to get a little, it, like th this is how I think about when I'm eating food out. Like, is that is that turkey like cooked in seed oils? I'm gonna need you to go to Disneyland. This would go viral. We and I'm gonna them. I'm gonna need you to go try the pickle and tell me if I can eat that big dick of a pickle <laughs> and also that turkey meat leg that everyone eats. Have you I, ever gone to Disneyland? You gotta go there. Many years ago. Okay, you, you gotta like go a, and do a thing. You should do that. Actually, I'm good. That's a good content idea. That would be <laughs> fucking amazing for you to go there and tell us what's in the turkey leg. But go ahead. So like turkey leg, if you're at the Renaissance Fair, right? And you want to eat the turkey leg, you just got to ask them, what is it cooked in? Because if it has seed oils on it, I would give it a pass. And we haven't talked about seed oils yet, but we'll, oh, we will We will foreshadow that. Okay. So dog ear that page. So no seed oils in your meat. But if you go to the grocery store, look, if finances are an issue, just get meat in your diet. But I think most people listening to this are interested in how do they make the best, most ethical choice, right? So then you want a meat that is grass fed and grass finished. There's a little interesting thing happening with labeling right now where some manufacturers are just putting grass fed on their meat. And that doesn't mean that the animal ate grass its whole life. It doesn't mean it's like these animals from white oak pastures that are on the pasture their whole life. And Whole Foods is tricky with this. And I've called them out on social media. For I'm this sure in the they past. love that. I'm sure they do. I'm sure a lot of companies have it out for me right now. So they have meat at Whole Foods, which is pasture raised. But if you ask them, it's grain finished at the end. And so I think that the ideal thing is for an animal to eat what it's supposed to eat its whole life. This actually parallels what we're trying to do with humans. This idea that we want humans to eat the most evolutionarily appropriate food, but you want your food to eat its most evolutionarily appropriate food also. So cows are supposed to eat grass. Their whole life is supposed to eat grass. And we know that when you feed cows grains at the end, it's great for the farmer's profit, but the cows get fat and sick and unhealthy and they accumulate all the things that are in the grains that are potentially bad for humans. 
So you don't ideally want a cow that's fed grains at any point in its life. You want grass-fed, grass-finished. And if you really want to do right, look for farms like White Oak Pastures. I think there's another one called Circle C. There's a farm here in Austin called, Sh called Shirttail Creek. Many other farms, Richardson Farms, are doing regenerative agriculture. That's kind of what I described at White Oak, where they're rotating pastures and the cows are fed grass their whole life. And it's better for the cow, it's better for the soil, and it's better for the whole life cycle. So I know. Really quick, I just have to ask this for my own selfish self. Are the, are are these that the the farms that you just mentioned? Are these brands that we can go on their website and purchase yeah. meat from? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so what? Force of Nature. That's what I eat. Force of Nature is great. Okay. I love them. Force of Nature, White Oak Pastures, Circle Seed, Richardson Farm, and you said one more. Uh, Shirt Tail Creek here in Austin. Shirt Tail Creek. Never mm -hmm. heard of that. Okay. So quickly, so what we try to do on this show is present the information and then strongly encourage people to think about the information in the way that um, best suits their life. Yeah. Uh, but also like candidly, we're very opinionated people and try to point people in the direction that we believe to be right. That being said, if you're sitting there and you're listening, like I'm vegan, I don't believe in any of this. I'm never going to change my diet. Michael, shut the fuck up. I'm annoyed of you trying to push this meat diet on me. What would you at least then encourage those people that don't have meat in their diet to supplement with? Because we're talking a lot about what they're potentially not getting and many may know, but I think a lot of vegans and I don't mean this to slap the whole community, be, are not educated on the things that they're maybe lacking out of from, from a meat-based diet, and they should consider supplementing with some of the things you mentioned. So I'm going to try and jujitsu the vegans listening to this and say, okay, if you don't want to eat meat, would you eat the organs? Because the meat is going to get, you know, produced anyway. And sometimes the organs get wasted. So if, if they would eat the organs, that would help a lot, right? And you could go to the store and eat literally a half an ounce of liver, the size of a quarter of liver would massively help a vegan from a nutritional standpoint. And that's one of the reasons I built Hardened Soil. So there's desiccated organs sitting on the table here from this company I built called Hardened Soil. And we do actually get vegans who will take the capsules because they don't have to see the liver. That's kind of this psychological barrier to getting back. And so there's desiccated liver. So that might be an option too. I think that the fresh liver is great or like a small amount of heart um, because, you, you know, those, those organs, every cow that gets killed for meat is going to have some organs somewhere. And so if you're eating organs, you might be able to think in your mind that this is going to be um, just a piece of the equation and it, you're not directly, re, you know, causing the cow to die, even though we talked about why that is probably not a bad deal. Sure. Failing that, I would say vegetarianism is a step in the right direction from veganism because eggs and milk are very nutritious for humans. Do you guys want to talk about raw milk? I want to talk about milk because... I love it. I, the, okay, Michael and I were having this debate today. I ordered coffee t for us and it was almond milk, but here's why. Okay. I, I can't know, stand no, the almond milk. Paul's going to agree with me, I think. No, he's not. I know the milk at the coffee store is not the right milk. It's it's like random, what's it called? Like Cudson, Nudson well, I don't want that milk, milk either. That I don't want. So well, I guess I what I should have done is get a black coffee, but... I don't want the shitty milk at the coffee store. If I'm having raw milk from the farmer's market, give it all to me. What's the vibe there? I don't there? believe in milking almonds either. I feel like that's just not, but that's not normal either. No, tell us the real vibe. So I'm going to, I'm going to side over here, you know, with Michael right now. It's, uh, I know. So I'm not a fan you. of almonds. I'm not a fan of almonds and almond milk. Let's talk about almond milk because this is a really interesting topic. Every time I talk about oat milk and almond milk, it goes viral. <laughs> the first thing you have to think about when you're thinking about a nut milk or a plant milk is, is are there seed oils in the milk? So you can, not the one I have, no. Okay. Milk. Okay, great. So there's no seed oils, but some of them do have canola oil. Then some of the some of the almond milks have carrageenan, which is a real problem because we talked about the importance of the gut earlier and how immune cells originate in the gut and they go to your brain for multiple sclerosis or they go to your pancreas for type 1 diabetes or they go to your skin for psoriasis and eczema or they go to your skin for acne. Like acne is autoimmune. And so you really need to protect your gut. And carrageenan is this, this is a technical word. It's a sulfated polysaccharide from algae that clearly causes damage to the gut. And it's in a lot of foods. It can be in creamers, even dairy creamers, but it's in a lot of these nut milks and that's going to harm your gut. So what you're saying is because I don't know the brand of the almond milk from the coffee store, which I don't, that it's it's better for me to just do a black coffee because I don't know the milk and I don't know the almond. If I'm at home though and I have a milk that doesn't have it in it, is it okay? And if not, why? Why don't you just fucking grow up and have a black coffee like a man, Lauren? <laughs> Maybe I will. <laughs> so I'm actually, and this is the last piece of this equation. I'm even not a fan of milks, of almond milks that are just almonds and water. And it's great. It's a great segue. This is why I'm not a fan of seeds. Go off on this because I have almond milk every day. Right, right. So almonds are seeds, right? Oats are grains, they're seeds. Seeds are the plant babies. They're the most highly defended parts of plants. They have so many defense chemicals in them. So almonds, 
have phytic acid, which is this chemical I mentioned earlier. I just make this, this you know, I, I gesticulate like this. It's a big molecule of chelates. It bites onto minerals. So phytic acid, we know, will prevent you from absorbing any minerals that you're eating with that phytic acid. So if you eat almond milk in the morning with an egg, for instance, you're going to absorb less of the nutrients, specifically the minerals from the egg because of the phytic acid in the almond milk. And so the other thing with almonds, they have digestive enzyme inhibitors and they have oxalates. There's a really interesting case series in kids and they had kids had genitourea, urinary issues. So they had urinary tract infections, kidney stones, and pain with urination that all got better when they removed almond milk from these kids' diets. And that's probably because of the oxalates. Oxalates is a fascinating rabbit hole. So oxalates is this compound, the body makes a small amount of it, but there is 10 to 100 times the amount that we make in plants, in, in our bodies found in plants. Spinach is an oxalate bomb and almonds are not far behind. So if you eat one cup of spinach, I think that the statistic is 550 milligrams of oxalates in one cup of spinach. Now, 550 milligrams of spinach of oxalates is a ton. And most people are going to eat more than a cup of spinach because you're going to cook it. It's going to be smaller, or you're going to dump two handfuls in your smoothie. You just got a thousand milligrams of oxalates. That's a significant amount. We absorb about 10% of those oxalates. So you're going to absorb 50 to 100 milligrams of oxalates from spinach. Just in that example, that's probably 10 times what your body's going to make in a day. It goes through your body. It accumulates in your joints, potentially in your thyroid. And we know that calcium oxalate kidney stones, the most common type of kidney stone. So spinach consumption directly linked to kidney stone formation in humans in general. And almonds also have oxalates. So I just want to finish this point so you understand the almonds, but it's parallel to the, to the spinach. Oxalates, phytic acid, digestive enzyme inhibitors. And it's just, there's not a lot of value in the almond milk. And it's just, it's kind of harming humans. The same thing with oats, phytic acid, all this kind of stuff. So- if you, you're at home, are you only having raw milk? Is there a brand that you're having? Is it from the farmer's market? Like how do we get the best milk that we can possibly get? Yeah. Let's keep going down the milk rabbit hole because there's a lot of interesting conversations here. So I have a podcast called Fundamental Health and I'm actually doing a dairy episode in the, like in the next week. I already recorded it. So it's fresh in my mind. So when you're thinking about milk, like if you go to a grocery store here, it's mostly Whole Foods here, but in LA is Erewhon, which has a little better selection. At Erewhon or at Whole Foods, you might see A2 milk. And this is an important distinction, A2 versus A1. I, I, I would prefer raw milk. You can't get raw milk at Whole Foods, but you can get raw milk at the farmer's market here in Austin. There's a farm called Richardson's that does raw milk. And I actually have some in my refrigerator of the Airbnb here. To answer your question, Lauren, yes, I only do raw milk. If I can't get raw dairy, I won't eat it. Because in the past, it has triggered my autoimmune disease and my eczema, the non-raw milk. But raw milk is unpasteurized. So in the 1900s, so milk has been a part of the human diet for probably 8,000 years. We know humans have been using this and the lactase gene is probably one of the most strongly selected for genes in human evolution. Early in Europe, maybe 9,000 years ago, humans didn't have lactase in their genome. We'd lost it. So only babies have it and then toddlers and we'd lose it. But when humans started drinking milk, we held on to that gene longer and longer, which is just a suggestion of how nutritious this food is. And if you look at the nutrients in milk, calcium, riboflavin, K2, uh, B12. I mean, there's so many nutrients in milk that are critical for human evolution. And there are interesting peptides, which help us be strong and sort of, I would say, vital and virile humans like IGF-1. But in the 1900s, milk took a turn for the worse because they were feeding cows swill, which is the original term for the dregs of the alcohol industry. So they were feeding them spent grains from alcohol and this really crappy food. So the milk lowers in quality and they have they have outbreaks in terms of contamination and bacteria in the milk in the early 1900s. You can imagine 1890 or 1900, somebody milking a cow in a, like a, a rundown building, you know, a hundred years ago, and they're feeding the cow just old grains from the production of alcohol. And that cow is not going to make good milk and there's not a lot of sanitation. So that was when pasteurization came in for milk. And that helped with the public health crisis of low quality milk. But it, it seems to destroy one of the proteins in milk, which is beneficial for humans called the whey protein. So when you heat the whey protein above 160 degrees Fahrenheit, which is what happens when you pasteurize the milk, that protein changes conformation. We know that proteins change conformation when you heat them. That's what happens to an egg white, which is clear. When you put it in a pan, it becomes white. It's changing conformation, so it looks different. There's really interesting data. There's multiple studies showing that kids who grow up drinking unpasteurized raw milk, and these are kids on or off farms, they have less allergy, eczema, and asthma, all the things that I suffered from, probably because of a protective protective effect of this whey protein. I'm going to the fucking farmer's market after this. It's We're getting raw milk. Yeah. 
And you can feed it to your kids if you, you know, if you make that decision, you feed it to your kids. You're giving them sort of this protection. Yeah, you put cacao in it too. You can get creative with the milk. Like, I feel like you can take the, the milk and do different things with it. You can thing, do all kinds of things with the milk. Yeah. The, I put honey in it. That's good. I, I am not nearly, obviously, as educated as you are on these things, but I, I try to keep it simple and just kind of like think common sense, right? And I read a lot of history, right? And I go back and I and I start to think about how people were able to eat and survive in the past. And there's like this fascinating thing I read about Genghis Khan back in the day. And it said like he, you know, they were obviously a warring Mongol tribe and they basically, they had the largest land empire in the history of the world and he conquered almost everything. A lot of the ways they survived on horseback was mixing the horse blood and the horse milk. And that, and the reason I mentioned this is many of us, I think I like the read that some crazy stat that there's a huge percentage of people on this planet that are potential descendants of Genghis Khan himself. <laughs> right. Is. Right. Um, and I, and, and I think that anytime I struggle with wondering like how a human would have gotten a certain thing, like an almond milk, for example, like we didn't have this 200 years ago or, um, you know, if they, if they didn't have an animal source and they were supplementing for some, like they couldn't do these things. So I just think the body has evolved to be able to handle certain things like milk because it was abundant and it was a source of, of animal protein or animal um, dairy that we were next to all the time. And it was easy to get. So of course our bodies probably evolved to be able to handle it. Um, and I think the reason we're struggling so much now as a population is we're introducing all these things that we haven't evolved with and the body cannot handle it. Right. So everyone, I believe, and this is going to sound crazy, four or 500 years from now, we will be able to handle things like plastic better because the body will build slowly defense systems. It's not great for us, but it's just, it's just the environment we live in where if you would have introduced people maybe 300 years ago to the stuff we're bombarded with now, it would just completely obliterated them. Maybe, maybe, but we know now that these things are clearly they're affecting, us. they're affecting fertility. I mean, you can look at like, you can look at penis size in males. You can look at the anogenital distance. Why well, do they have small penises well, our environment from is, soy? Our environment Phalates. is outpacing our evolution. Phthalates are making your penis small. Yes. What are phthalates? So phthalates. Everyone's are, like, give me the fuck away from phthalates. <laughs> what are phthalates? So phthalates are these synthetic compounds found in fragrances. And this is like when I get in an Uber and there's a black ice. I can't. Tree. We, you and I could talk for hours yeah. about this. Go on. There's a black ice tree in the on the rearview mirror and you're smelling it, right? And you're thinking, oh, this is gross. I roll down the window. Even in New York when it was freezing, I'm rolling down the freaking window and the guy's like, what? I'm just, I'm just to drive the car. Just get me there. And you get out of the Uber and you still smell like black ice, right? Or you're in a house or, you know, I took my car to the mechanic the other day in, in Costa Rica, which is where I live. And I, they took it to get uh, something done. And, and I got the car back and the car smelled like the mechanic's cologne. And then I have to wash the seat. I think uh, leather seats, but I have to wash the seat and like my clothes smell like the cologne. Those are phthalates. They're sticky. They carry fragrance. Every time you walk into a room and you see those Glade plugins in the corner, it's putting phthalates into the air. So these, these compounds, they're in perfumes, not all perfumes, but some of them are worse than others. They're in lotions. Um, they're fragrance in lotions. It's hidden. And, and also like, I'm sorry, guys, when you wear too strong of cologne, it makes <laughs> me want to puke. Like just like tone back the cologne. Yeah. When I'm on an elevator with a guy and it's too strong, I'm like, oh, it's horrible. And so they're, they're fragrance and they're in a lot of things. And sometimes they say, sometimes it'll say phthalates and, or sometimes it'll just say fragrance. They're hidden on labels. But these are clearly endocrine disruptors. This word xenoestrogen is the fancy word for endocrine disruptors. They mimic estrogen in both men and women, and then they accumulate in women's bodies. So the, the history of this or the, the pathway is probably that women are exposed to these. And if they're carrying a male fetus, then it affects the male during gestation. And it leads to shrinking of the distance between the butthole and the end of the testicles, which is the anogenital distance, which is an indication of feminization of males and then shrinking of the penises. One thing that I think has really changed my life since moving to Austin is being thoughtful and purposeful with my cleaning supplies. When I moved here, I made a conscious effort to get rid of anything that was full of shit. And so I switched to Branch Basics. And I chose this brand because I asked a lot of people like scientists and even like doctors behind the scenes what their favorite cleaning supply brand was. And I said, what is like the best non-toxic, hypoallergenic, fragrance-free brand? And everyone kept saying Branch Basics. So I switched everything in the house to Branch Basics, I could not be happier. First of all, it's baby and pet safe. I have a baby who's crawling right now and my daughter always runs around without shoes on in the house. So it's really important to me to clean our floors with something that is non-toxic. I really like, and this is the one I started with, their premium starter kit. It gives you everything you need to replace all your toxic cleaning supplies in your home. It's just like a no-brainer. They also have a refill model. So once you run out, it's just very easy and seamless to repurchase. 
You should also know if you suffer from eczema, allergies, or asthma, making the switch to Branch Basics is the move. So many people have said their rashes clear up after switching. I love it so much. I actually reached out to the founders to come on the show. So they gave you a code. You can save 15% and get free shipping when you use code SKINNY at branchbasics.com. That's code SKINNY at branchbasics.com for 15% off. If you're in the market for a new car, you have to check out one of our favorite new partners, one of our favorite platforms, and that is Vroom. With Vroom, you can shop thousands of cars right from your phone and have your next ride delivered straight to you. I love all of these groundbreaking, industry-disrupting companies that are creating better technology with more choices for consumers, and Vroom is definitely doing that. Vroom is just the better way to buy your next car. No more haggling or negotiating the price of a car so you know you're getting a great deal. Another great feature about shopping for a car with Vroom is that you have a full week or 250 miles, whichever comes first, to make sure your new ride is right for you. This is an amazing feature that protects you as a consumer and makes sure you get exactly what you want. Vroom cars also come with a 90-day limited warranty and a one-year of roadside assistance nationwide to give you that peace of mind on the road. If you have an old car, you can also trade that car in when you buy your new car, or you can even just sell it to Vroom right off the bat. It's an amazing service as they give you your price instantly and will even come to pick up your old car. No more meeting up with strangers and haggling over the price with somebody you don't know. Vroom is just a better way to buy your car. So if you're a car lover and you're looking for something new and unique, just visit Vroom.com. You can buy a car from Vroom entirely online. So next time you need to buy a car, just grab your phone, go to Vroom.com and check out thousands of cars. Again, that's Vroom.com. You can buy a car from Vroom entirely online. So next time you need to buy a car, just grab your phone, go to Vroom.com and check out thousands of cars. Skims. Skims is the solution-oriented brand creating the next generation of underwear, loungewear, and shapewear for everybody. So Skims has sort of taken me through my evolution of motherhood. I wore it after my pregnancy with Zaza when I was breastfeeding. I wore it when I was pregnant with Towns. And then I wore it when I was in postpartum recovery and like trying to tighten things up. And I still wear it. So I just feel like there's something for everybody and every single part of the journey. The Fits Everybody collection of underwear is the move. They're lightweight, they're form-fitting essentials, and everything is just like buttery soft. It molds to your body and it also stretches. So I can wear the same bra that I wore when I was pregnant now, which is really nice. It stretches to like twice its size. It's also offered in a range of cuts and fits. So you can get underwear, bras, dresses, t-shirts, bodysuits, and everything has like a range which I love. It's available in sizes XXS to 4X. I usually wear medium and it's offered in nine core colorways and limited edition seasonal colors. I love the black and the nude, especially for the underwear. Right now, I'm obsessed with the crossover bralette. It's so good. Go check it out. Believe the hype. This collection has over 90,000 five-star reviews for a reason. Skims fits everybody and more best-selling essentials are available now at skims.com. Plus get free shipping on orders over $75 all at skims.com. That's so interesting that you say this because when we moved to Austin, I changed all of our cleaning supplies. I changed everything. I completely like redid my whole house. And I'm so happy I did that when I was pregnant with my son. I, and I Thank also, God. you know what else I got rid of? <laughs> Tell me if there's phthalates in this. Candles that have fragrance. Well, yeah, probably. Like I just got beeswax candles. They're so much better. They're so much better. Yeah, but you bring up the laundry detergent is a problem because it can have these fragrances. So when I came to this Airbnb in Austin, I'm surprised Airbnb even lets me use their app because every Airbnb I do, I message the person, hey, can you wash all the sheets and all the towels in vinegar or a fragrance-free detergent? What's it, your favorite? I just, I just use vinegar. But if you have to use a detergent. I think seventh generation, like free and clear is the one with the least amount. Again, there's so much to talk about of one for dioxane. Okay. So if we're talking about laundry detergent specifically, we did content about this. New York state has outlawed any detergent with more than two parts per million of one for dioxane, which is a probable carcinogen. Also, what in the fuck are people thinking sleeping on a pillow all night, breathing in like the most toxic diet? I I guess people, I I, I guess I have to give people the benefit of the doubt. They aren't thinking it. What are the companies thinking to let us sleep for eight to nine hours on this smell that smells like perfume all night? I can't do it. And then I can't even sleep on the sheets in the Airbnb because I don't want, I don't want cotton polyester sheets. I bring my own sheets. And Paul, if we were married, you would. 
You're not on board with this? No, I, he's he's no. he's gotten on board. Yeah. He's gotten Here, on here's board. Here's the thing. I am on board with it, but I'm also not neurotic with it. Like, I'm first, neurotic. I try to, I'm neurotic. I'm neurotic. <laughs> no, I'm bringing my barefoot dreams blanket that was washed in Molly's suds. But, like, but here's the thing. Myself. I try to take an educated approach to this and try to be 90% of the time perfect. But like, I just had to go to New York and stay in a hotel. And like, I just, there was, I had no, there was no other, I've just, you know, I'm not going to sit there and be like, holy shit, what's going on? We because could write I had a book no, though about like Larry David ones. Like, what about when you're eating your food and then they take Windex and start to clean the table with it. It's, I'm, it drives me nuts. Or, the, me or nuts. you get a water with a plastic straw in it. I can't do it. I or can't you drink, drink a coffee yeah. and it's piping hot and there's a plastic lid. Well, we could go on and on and oh on. Yeah, and I got I to gotta, I gotta, I gotta tell you about coffee <laughs> even more. So there are, there are compounds called PFAs. So perifluoroalkylated compounds. These are forever chemicals now in the popular press. They're in plastics. You get a coffee from Starbucks. It's in the paper cup. That paper cup is lined with plastic with PFAs in it. So you have a piping hot coffee in a paper cup that's lined with plastic. That's giving you estrogen, right? Well, PFAs <clears throat> PFAs can be estrogenic or they can be cancer causing, but yes, they're also endocrine disruptors. And you go to Whole Foods and they have this paper, this sort of uh, brown paper carrier for your Whole Foods hot bar thing. You think you're doing the right thing? It's lined with plastic and that can have PFAs in it. You go to Whole Foods and you get the butcher paper. It's lined with plastic that can have PFAs in it. So really... I, at this point, when I talk about this, people become overwhelmed and they kind of throw their hands up, but knowledge is power. Know better, do better. And like every intentional choice that you make is a step in the right direction, like you did. Right. I don't think that it's, I don't think that you have to be psycho about it, but I just learned the other day about a plastic cutting board and I was cutting my son's like fruit on it to make him his thing. And so if I can eliminate a plastic cutting board and get a wood one, like I'm going to do that. I don't think it's about being perfect. I just think it's, tiny little changes that you can make throughout your day that make a big difference overall. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about, so you started as carnivore MD and at that point where you only eat, you, you try to only eat meat, no fruit, no honey, nothing. And why, and why did you decide to do, to do that in the beginning? So that was sort of the intention. Let's cut everything out and see how this works with a very, let's just say intentional elimination and diet. It's become way more popular. I mean, you've been a pioneer of this, but it's become like more and more people are talking yeah, yeah, about this. Yeah, it's become very popular. And so I ate meat and organs and animal fat and salt for a year and a half. Eczema gets better. I think I lost a small amount of weight. I think if I look back at myself during that period, my muscles were not as full. But generally, my life was pretty good. I could go to the gym. I could do things. When I would go climbing, because there was a climbing gym in Seattle that I would go to, I would get... I started living get, in Seattle at this time. Yeah, I was living in Seattle. So I was sun deprived. But we can talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> Get the fuck out of the sun, she says. That's different, though. We'll, we'll talk we'll about talk that. About we'll it. talk about that. Um, so I would get cramps when I would climb. If anyone's ever climbed, you know, you sort of point your toes, you dorsiflex, technical term, and I would get cramps in my, in my calves. And as I did that longer and longer, I'm pretty low carb, essentially zero carb keto. I began to get more cramps in the morning. Anyone who's keto knows that when you wake up in the morning, if you point your toes, you're going to get a massive calf cramp. And eventually that got worse and worse for me. And I had to think about things and, and understand that long-term ketosis is harmful for humans, I believe strongly now. And this is to say that what I learned- And how do you qualify long-term ketosis? Like It's going to be different between person to person, but I would right now I would say anything longer than like three or four days. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah. And I did it for a year and a half. But the first thing I learned was, okay, cutting vegetables out was beneficial. Well, let's just say this. Cutting everything out was beneficial for me from an autoimmune perspective. And then I reincorporated what I believe to be the least toxic plant foods which are the fruit. So when you think about things from a plant's perspective, this kind of helps put things in context. Plants are life. They're anti-entropy. They're, they're beautiful. They're really interesting. How does a plant live, right? It's rooted in the ground. It can't run away from you. I was over at Barton Springs last night. There's the big monkey tree. It's a huge, beautiful tree. There's all these trees. There's a cottonwood tree shooting out. It's like uh, seeds with these uh, like little cotton balls that's floating through the air at Barton Springs. But none of those trees can want to run away from me. So if I'm an animal that wants to eat those leaves or chew on the bark or eat the roots, I can just walk up to it and just have at it. It's like a buffet. And so over the course of our co-evolution as life forms, multicellular life forms and plants, we have over 500 million years, we've had to, plants have evolved defense chemicals. We know this. There's so many of these chemicals that sort of push animals, insects, fungi away from plants to prevent them from just eating each other. So if you think about it from a plant's perspective, a plant is rooted in the ground. It can't run away. Animals can eat it. Insects can eat it. So there's been this co-evolution, this arms race between animals, insects, whatever, life forms, multicellular life forms that are non-plants and plants for 400 million years. And plants develop a defense chemical that says, hey, don't eat me because I'm toxic. And we, there are so many examples of this, right? There's, there's 
botanical evidence. When I was in college, I hated botany, but now I really appreciate it. It's fascinating. That was my worst grade in college. I was so pissed at botany. Um, but there's evidence that if, if a plant senses the vibrations of a caterpillar eating leaves adjacent to another leaf, it will put more defense chemicals in the leaf. So plants are so smart. They can sense the vibrations of a caterpillar eating a leaf, and they will pump more defense chemicals into different leaves. In Costa Rica, we have leaf cutter ants. I don't know if you guys have ever seen these ants. They're amazing. They're, they, they walk in a line. They're, they're these ants carrying these pieces of leaves that are multiple times their body weight. And leaf cutter ants will just decimate a forest or decimate a tree. And so, but when trees sense or bushes sense that they're having leaf cutter ant infestation, they will put more defense chemicals in their leaves and the, it poisons the ants and the ants have to move on to a new tree or a new bush. So plants do this with insects, but they've also done it with humans. And because they've done it with other animals, herbivorous animals have sort of evolved. They've evolved more defense chemical or more, more ways to detoxify the defense chemicals in plants. If you look at a ruminant stomach, like a cow stomach, very different than ours. They have different detoxification pathways. Um, sheep and moose have enzymes in their saliva that detoxify some of these chemicals as they're chewing them and the chemicals sort of evaporate. And animals that are herbivorous know this. There's documented cases of animals dying off in mass when they're corralled into too small a space because they can only eat one type of plant and the, the animals can only detoxify so much of that plant's defense chemical. They just all, all the animals die. So when animals are in the wild, they're not just eating one plant. They're going between multiple plants. They're so smart. This is animal evolution, right? They know, okay, I can only eat a little bit of this plant and a little bit of this plant, a little bit of this plant so that all of my detoxification pathways in my body can get rid of these defense chemicals. But as humans, we just like throw five hands bowls of spinach and we just eat spinach and spinach and spinach. All we eat is spinach. Or I mean, when I was a vegan, all I ate for seven months was two heads of kale a day. I and doesn't kale, isn't it so bad for your thyroid? It's horrible for your thyroid. And isn't like the, the little bristles that get stuck with all those pesticides? I'm sure it could. And there's actually kale accumulates thallium. So thallium is a heavy metal in the soil. And there's people who have had thallium toxicity from eating kale. And multiple leafy greens can do this. They'll pull it up from the soil and you can check for heavy metals from the kale and stuff. But we don't, we don't do this as humans. We're not eating a little bit of this leaf and a little bit of this leaf and a little bit of this leaf. And if you go back to the hunter-gatherers where we come from as humans, they don't eat salads. The Hadza never ate a leaf the whole time I was with them. And this is a hunter-gatherer tribe. They're literally wearing animal skins in Africa. What do they look like? They're, they're super handsome people. Lean. No, I mean, they're like, what is, is, are they muscular? Are yeah. they lean? Like what's... They're, they're muscular, but um, perhaps a little less muscular than me. They're not as muscular as you because they probably don't get enough food to be that muscular. They don't, they don't have enough animals in their diets, but they, they are lean humans. There's no obese hunter gatherer, but there's pictures of um, Polynesian Islanders and stuff. And they, they're very, they're, they're muscular. They look like a guy who's an athlete going to the gym. They look like, um, what's a good example? Not like a bodybuilder, obviously, but like, like a sprinter. They might look like that level of um, muscle. For, for all the women listening who, let's say they're like me, they're postpartum, they want to tone up, they want to maybe lose a couple pounds. What are some benefits when it comes to weight loss or muscle with meat and raw milk and honey and fruit and the way you eat? I would love to know more about like the body composition aspect. Yeah. So weight loss is really interesting to me because I think that most of what we're told is wrong. I don't think weight loss is about eating less calories and exercising more. That's kind of the biggest loser formula when taken to extremes. But we know that 96% of people on the biggest loser gain the weight back plus more. And so when you're trying to lose weight and you're limiting calories and you're over-exercising, you're basically hurting your thyroid gland. The body's very smart. You're telling your body that it's starving. You're telling your body that whatever tribe you're in, there's not enough food there and you have to walk for miles a day to find the next set of food. That's going to make you less fertile and it's going to tone your thyroid gland down. This kind of happens with the ketogenic diet also. Sure. Your, your thyroid gland goes down, your, your metabolism goes down. And that means that you're almost in a race to the bottom. And I've, I've talked to so many women about this. Women who do figure competitions run into this problem because they want to get so lean. And they, they say, well, I'm, I can't lose weight. I have to do more cardio and eat less. And the next week, their thyroid goes down even more. That means their metabolism, their baseline, how many calories they burn at baseline goes down even more. So they have to work out more and eat less, work out more and eat less. And eventually so many of these figure competitors who are just an illustration of this taken to extremes end up with complete hormonal crash. They don't have periods. They're not, they don't have any libido and they're, they're basically have no energy. And so that's, that's not what you want. What you want is to lose weight in a healthful manner with your thyroid working as much as possible. You want your metabolism to be as high as possible when you're losing weight, not as low as possible. 
So you have to give your body the signal of abundance. And the signal of abundance comes from two things, in my opinion. It comes from the nutrients and animal foods, and it comes from carbohydrates. And if you don't give your body carbohydrates, this is going back to the keto conversation, your thyroid will go down. Your metabolism will go down. Your stress hormones will go up. And it makes sense evolutionarily. If we're in a tribe and you're postpartum in the tribe and your body needs a signal of abundance, we better be around some fruit or some carbohydrates for you because that's what signals to your body that's abundance. Or if you're looking to get pregnant, that's abundance. That's the time when it's a fertile time for humans. When there's no carbohydrates around, the body's like, whoa, it's winter. Yeah, your body's telling you you shouldn't get pregnant right now because you're not going to be able to survive that Exactly. Pregnancy. Exactly. And so women shouldn't fear carbohydrates. And we can talk about which carbohydrates I think are better for women, which won't hurt the gut as much or trigger. Yeah, we love easy. details. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they shouldn't fear meat. So the nutrients in meat, let's start there. Meat and organs, those nutrients help with satiety and they give the body a signal of abundance. So meat and organs. What organs specifically? Start with liver, right? Liver. Liver is tricky, but you know, you can do desiccated organs like hardened soil, or you can do fresh, a little bit frozen. It's not that bad. Plug my thing with, with it's beauty. The benefits just plug the nose. Yeah. Yeah. And I freeze the liver. So I'll take liver. I'll cut it up into little pieces. You can put it in, in like a silicone tray. Those are not, yeah. I don't think those are that toxic. And you can have a little piece of liver, like the size of a quarter is half an ounce. And if it's frozen, you chew it, or you can have it thawed and just do a shooter with, with uh, like a drink. How do I get my three-year-old to eat liver? Put it in a smoothie. Okay. Yep. You can put, put it in, in a, a smoothie. A yep. smoothie. Yep. Or you can empty the capsules into a smoothie. He'll never know. I think it's worth looking into your message or another yeah. message and figuring out like, maybe you got to try something different. And like worst cases, you could always go back to what you were doing, Yeah. but like, why not try something and see if it works? Intentional choices are, it's, that's, that's where the magic is. Yep. And doing something. I must say that you are super glowy from the beef fat. Uh, that yeah. he good, on your bro. Yeah, yeah. He put beef fat all over his face. I'm going to do it tonight. I'm You're like looking Benjamin glowy. Button now. I'm yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the key to youth, beef fat on the face. It really helps. I think it's the, the food you eat, you know. You never yeah. know what you're going to get from this podcast. Thank as you, long Paul. as you didn't come in here and say Thank I had white guys. testicles on my face. <laughs> I mean, it's like. <laughs> I mean. Cheers, man. Thank you, guys.